From the Gospel according to John in the first chapter, verses 29 through 42. This happens right after uh, John has baptized Jesus. The next day, he, John the baptizer, saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here's the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. May God's word be revealed in this reading. Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <sighs> Families are always interesting. Families have a way of being weird at times. I have a brother who's 10 years younger than I am. I have a sister who's five years younger than I am. That makes me the firstborn. Imagine my dismay when my two sons and their wives were sitting at table one time and we were talking about birth rank and it comes out that five of the six there were firstborns. My wife Cheryl is a firstborn, my first son and then both of the wives were firstborns in their families. Now, one of the things that happens with firstborns is that we know everything. If you have a question, just ask us, and we will let you know. Families are very important. We grew up traveling around the world. My dad was in the Air Force, and so every three or four years, it's like, okay, where are we going this time, Dad? And as a result, it became that the family brothers and sisters, mom and dad, became very important to us. Because wherever we went, we didn't know who would be our friend next week. We had to be the new kid all the time. But it was the family that stuck together. It's the family that loved one another. It's the family that was there. But families kind of grow apart at times. I'm going to say this, but it's not as bad as you might want to hear it. I don't talk to my brother. It's not that I don't talk to my brother. I just don't have any reason to talk with him. He'll send me an email, maybe. He might text me. But if we get together once a year, that's one more than we did last year. It's not that there's any animosity between us. It's just that we just don't communicate. My sister's the same way. About once a month, I'll get this long missive in email. Oh, this is what we're family is up to. And I'll answer with, I'm fine. <laughs> Everything's good. But families have that way of making us 
question sometimes what we are about. Questioning of where we are going. <sighs> Some families I know, their brothers and sisters don't even talk to one another. Because of a misunderstanding, because of lack of communication, they choose not to talk with their brother or sister. And as a result, the tensions that happen within those families become so immense that just the bare mention of the brother or sister's name is one that tears the family apart. How sad is that? You probably have that same in your family somewhere. You might know of a family that that's torn apart. But our story today is one about what's important in life to everybody. John the baptizer came down and was baptizing with water. It was a, a Jewish rite, saying that I'm going to live a new life. He came down to the Jordan and there the people came out of Jerusalem down to where he was. He wasn't in some nice big church in Castroville. But no, he was down by the riverside waiting for people to come. And there he baptized. And Jesus came to him and says, I need to be baptized by you. So he did. The next day, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And then, according to John, he goes into this big theological discursion about what it is. See, in, in, in John, it was not God that came and said, this is my son, but it was John the baptizer. It was not God that said that, it was John. And said that this is the son of God, because I looked in his eyes. And I saw the Spirit descend upon him. And I knew with a certainty that this was the Lamb of God. Now, we can get into the theological stuff of what's happening there. But basically what John is saying is that this is the Lamb which will be sacrificed for the world. This is the Lamb of God which will be killed for us. This is the Son of God. Now, the next day, He's standing with two of his disciples. And look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples get interested, and they start following Jesus. Now, this might be the one time that we hear of stalking in the Bible, because Jesus turns around and says, what do you want? Now, if I were those disciples... I would have a whole list of questions to ask. John the baptizer says you're the Lamb of God. That means certain things to us. That means that you are the one who is going to save us. You are the one who's going to be the Messiah. How's that come about? How are you the Son of God? Answer these theological questions for me. But no. What they said was, where are you staying? Don't you want to know about other things? But no, these two disciples said, where are you staying? You can find out a lot about people when you go into their homes, when you go to see what's on their walls, when you look at the things and paintings that they have. Cheryl and I are not much on big decorating things. Most of our decorations are prints and pictures and art like that. We are collect Native American images both by Native American artists as well as others. Uh, and wherever we live, we picked up those paintings of Hawaii, Japan, all over the world. And that's how you can tell where we have been by looking at our house. I don't even have to be there to tell you my life, because you will see it. So it's interesting that the disciples come and say, where are you staying? And Jesus' response was, not what I would say. It's like, why are you following me? Why do you really want? Why do you want to see where I'm staying? But he said, come 
and see. He didn't start talking. He didn't start palavering. He didn't start waving his arms like preachers do. But he said, come and see. And so they went with him to his house about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and visited. And they talked and talked back and forth. We don't know what was said. We don't even know who the other disciple was of the two. It's an unnamed disciple of John. But the one we do know was Andrew. Now, we know that Andrew's brother is Simon. And later on in the story, we come to know why he's called Simon Peter. It's because Jesus looked at him and says, You are my rock. And so I'm going to call you Cephas, which is Aramaic word for rock. Petra in the Greek. And so that was changed to Peter. Simon Peter. Simon the rock. Rocky. It's what you put everything on. It's what you base the church on. Theus is the keys of the kingdom. Rocky. Now the interesting thing to note is that in the New Testament, Simon Peter, Simon Peter is mentioned 150 times. Would you care to guess how many times Andrew is mentioned? 13. Less than one-tenth of his brother's fame. So does that make Andy unimportant? No. Because he was the first to hear. And what did he do? He went to his brother and said, We have met the Messiah. We have met the Anointed One, the King of God's kingdom. How can there be bad news? If Andrew had not done that, the whole New Testament would have been different. If Andrew had not gone to his brother and say, I've got the most glorious news in the world. Would you do that with your brother and sister? Or do you say, hey, I got a new Swiffer and it works great. I've got this new car and it runs good. I've got this new gadget that makes cooking potatoes fantastic. <sighs> Amazing the important things that we share with our brothers and sisters. Those things that are so important and life-changing. And all this leads up to this question. <sighs> when was the last time you told your brother and your sister about Jesus? When was the last time that you shared your faith with those of your family? When was the last time you said, here I am and I invite you to come and see Jesus alive. I invite you to come and see what is important in my life. And to share that not just with your biological siblings, but with your brothers and sisters in Christ. For we all need to be upheld. We all need to share our faith. We all need to be the people that God has called us to be. So let us put the priorities of life where they should be. And if we proclaim that I am Christian, that Jesus is the center of my life, then we must truly seek first our brothers and sisters. Come. Come and see. Let us pray.